This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. The annual Congress of the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ESMO, is one of the most influential oncology meetings for clinicians, researchers, patient advocates, and healthcare industry representatives from all over the world. This year, the ESMO Congress, which was held in Paris, France, presented the very latest advances in the treatment of cancer and offered an excellent educational program with opportunities for an exchange of ideas among delegates through an enhanced on-site as well as a virtual experience. In this episode of the Onkishim Brief, I'm talking with three people involved in some of the most exciting developments in cancer research. I asked them about their research and the latest advances in the war on cancer. My first interview is with Dr. Eric Vervier. Dr. Vervier is Senior Vice President and Scientific Officer of Innate Pharma. His company is developing new anti-cancer drugs designed to harness the power of NK, or natural killer cells. I'm also talking with Dr. Daniel Tepper. Dr. Tepper is co-founder, chairperson, and chief executive officer of Cytovia Therapeutics. Cytovia is developing precision NK therapeutics, which may revolutionize cancer treatment. And finally, I'm talking with Dr. Neil Bender. Dr. Bender is Director of Urological Oncology Research at Weill Cornell Medicine and co-founder of Convergent Therapeutics. We talk about prostate cancer, including the first antibodies to specifically target prostate-specific membrane antigen, or PSMA, and we talk about other developments in the field. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosine Brief. The Oncosine Brief is developed in collaboration with our online journal, Oncosine, where you can find additional information and the latest news about cancer, cancer diagnosis and treatment, and cancer prevention. For information on how to support this program, visit our website at oncosine.com. And if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866, and we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. This is the Yonkazine Brief. For the latest news about cancer and cancer treatment, visit our online journal, Oncazine, at www.oncazine.com. In this episode of the Oncazine Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Eric Vervier, Dr. Daniel Tepper, and Dr. Neil Bender about some of the latest developments in cancer research presented during the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ESMO, held earlier this year in Paris, France. In the studio today is Dr. Eric Vervier. Dr. Vervier is Senior Vice President and Scientific Officer of Innate Pharma. Dr. Vervier, welcome to the Oncosim Brief. Good morning. We're here at the annual meeting of the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ASMO. Over the last couple of days, we've heard about many new and interesting developments in oncology. And one of the presentations included a drug called Lacutamab, which is being developed by your company for the treatment of T-cell lymphoma. Tell me a little bit more about this drug and about the disease that you're targeting. So T-cell lymphomas are, can be divided in two major categories. On one side, you have peripheral T-cell lymphoma. On the other side, you have a subcategory, which are T-cell lymphoma that home the skin, called cutaneous T-cell lymphoma. It turns out that uh, we discovered years ago that uh, some of these T-cell lymphoma cells express molecules that have been originally defined on natural killer cells. And uh, at Nid Pharma, we are focusing much of our activity on natural killer cells. So we had antibodies directed against this molecule. So we have generated lacutamab as an antibody that can recognize these molecules, which are tumor antigens expressed on T-cell lymphoma, in particular cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and within cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, you have a subcategory of molecule of, of um, disease called Cesare syndrome, in, in which uh, this molecule called KIRS3DL2 uh, is really overexpressed. 
So lacutamab is a monoclonal antibody, a therapeutic monoclonal antibody, uh, which can recognize KIRS3DL2, which is, as I said, overexpressed in some T-cell lymphoma, in particular Cesare syndrome, and then cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, and then some peripheral T-cell lymphoma. So the idea is to induce the recognition of these tumor cells by the antibody. And once these uh, tumor cells are coated with the antibody, uh, several effector cells of the immune system can recognize them. In particular, natural killer cells can recognize antibody-coated target cells. And uh, we have uh, compelling evidence it's in vitro, showing that uh, uh, NK cells can really uh, nicely recognize these antibody coated target cells and participate to their elimination. So lacutamab has been developed by, uh, uh, by Inet Pharma, and, and uh, so it's now in, in clinical trials, and, and we have uh, uh, very interesting uh, results already obtained uh, uh, with lacutamab in, in Cesare syndrome, and, and then we are uh, exploring um, the extension of the activity of lacutamab in other kinds of T-cell lymphoma, as I said. So the other kind of cutaneous T-cell lymphoma, such as uh, mycosis fugoides uh, and peripheral T-cell lymphoma. So if I understand correctly, you aim to develop a broad spectrum treatment for T-cell lymphoma and related diseases. Is that correct? Well, so basically, we started using lacutamab in Cesare syndrome, which is a subgroup of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Now we are extended the analysis of the action of uh, lacutamab in cutaneous T cell lymphoma of other categories, just, such as mycosis fugoides. And then we are also exploring peripheral T cell lymphomas. Right. Now, in your approach, NK cells or natural killer cells play a major role. Tell me a little bit more about this. Yes, yeah, so NK cells are a very intriguing kind of lymphocytes. Uh, they have been discovered close to 50 years ago as being lymphocytes, which are non-T cells, non-B cells. We and others have largely contributed to the understanding of the dissection at the molecular level of the biology of this cell. And uh, in a nutshell, these lymphocytes are cytotoxic lymphocytes effector cells that can kill other cells. That's one of the modes of action of the natural killer cells. But very importantly as well, once NK cells are activated, in particular when they recognize tumor cells, they can also secret, secret an array of cytokines and chemokines that participate to the initiation, meaning the onset, but also the maintenance of a much broader immune response, including T cells. So basically, when you can harness the activity of NK cells at the tumor bed, you can, first of all, eliminate the tumor cells directly by direct killing. But also, you can, so to speak, light the fire of the immune response at the tumor bed through the secretion of cytokines and chemokines that will help in the uh, onset and maintenance of a T-cell response against tumor. So this is why we think these cells are so interesting. Importantly also, NK cells can be infused into patients and are, have a very uh, manageable safety profile. So we at Innate Pharma, we are targeting NK cells. We are harnessing the function of NK cells through different kinds of monoclonal antibodies. Um, and in particular, we have recently focused our studies on the generation of a new platform of antibody-based NK cell engager therapeutics that we call ANCET, uh, which have a lot of very interesting features. Without uh, going into uh, great detail, uh, these, cell, these molecules are unique because they can co-engage two very important activating NK cell receptors the first one is NKP46, the other one is CD16 on the NK cell side. But as these molecules are multifunctional, they can also engage at the same time a tumor antigen. So they basically create a bridge or a synapse, if you want, between NK cells on one side and tumor cells on the other side. But more than that, they also activate NK cells at the same time. In, therefore, inducing the killing of the tumor cells in return, but also inducing 
uh, the array of cytokines and chemokines that I told you about, which can then activate other cells. So it's really, again, this image of lighting the fire of the immune response as the tumor bed. So we have developed many different kinds of enquêtes, uh, and we have disclosed uh, some of uh, our results. In particular, here at ESMO, uh, we have been talking about two kinds of enquêtes. One uh, uh, enquête which has been um, generated in collaboration with Sanofi, which is recognizing a tumor antigen, uh, which is expressed on acute um, myeloid leukemia blast. And uh, the idea here uh, is to uh, actually uh, harness the function of NK cells against its AML blast. And we have also re more recently generated a, a, a new uh, generation of enquête which are not trifunctional as the first one, but tetrafunctional. And they actually address uh, IL-2, the interleukin-2, which is a very strong activator of, of NK cells, towards NK cells, through this multifunctional, actually tetrafunctional uh, enquête, and we have presented this data as well. In this approach, you engage the immune system and, as you said earlier in the program, light a fire under the immune system, correct? That's what we are trying to do, yes. Let's take a break. This is the Oncosin Brief. If you're just joining us, in today's episode of the Oncosin Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Eric Vervier, Dr. Daniel Tapper, and Dr. Neil Bender about some of the latest developments in cancer research presented during the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ESMO, held earlier this year in Paris, France. I'm Peter Hofland, and this is the Oncosin Brief. Each day, researchers make discoveries that bring us closer to the moment when all cancer patients can become survivors. Their progress is made possible with the help of clinical trials. Clinical trials are the brightest torch researchers have to light their way towards better treatments. And if you've been diagnosed with cancer, they may be your brightest ray of hope. Speak with your doctor and visit standuptocancer.org slash clinical trials to learn more. Together, we can stand up for all of us. This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. This is the Yonkazine Brief. If you're just joining us, in today's episode of the Yonkazine Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Eric Vervier, Dr. Daniel Tapper, and Dr. Neil Bender about some of the latest developments in cancer research presented during the annual Congress of the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ASMO, held earlier this year in Paris, France. Now, one of the things that you do different than others is that you use NK cells or natural killer cells in fighting cancer instead of, for example, T cells. You've already explained some of the reasons why you do this, but tell me a little bit more about this approach and the benefits. Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, the number of NK cells is basically 10 times less than the number of T cells. So that can be seen as a limitation in the harnessing of NK cells in tumors. But if you take into consideration that NK cells are very efficient cells, this, has, uh, this is more complex. And actually, this is an advantage. Uh, why? Well, because T cell engagers, for example, have been developed. And they have shown some activities, in particular, against hematologic malignancies. But there is a cost to this efficacy. Uh, which is uh, safety issues, uh, concerns, uh, which are observed using these uh, T-cell engagers. In particular, there is cytokine release syndrome, uh, which is due to the fact that when you engage many, many T-cells, you can have elevation of, of uh, serum cytokines. We just don't see that with NK-cell engagers. We see a little bit uh, of an increase of inflammatory cytokines, which is a good sign of, of the activity of these NK cell engagers, but um, uh, in general, we see the elevation in the serum being 100 to 1,000 times less than one can see with the T cell engagers. So we do think that NK cell engagers are a very nice option in uh, the second generation 
of immunotherapeutic assets because they will harness the function of, of cells, which again, can not only kill tumor cells, but also secrete uh, an array of cytokines and chemokines. Second, uh, these cells, these NK cells, have the propensity through an array of activating receptors to recognize tumor cells. And thirdly, they are really safe in their manipulation. So one of the benefits of this approach is the manageability of adverse events, but also the fact that this approach results in fewer adverse events, correct? Exactly. Now, looking at your development program, what are some of the milestones you're trying to realize in the near future? Thanks for the question. So one can maybe divide this question into two parts. Uh, what are uh, the news expected for enquête on one side and what are the news regarding la QTAMA? So if we start by enquête, we have generated a proprietary tetraspecific uh, enquête, which is called IPH65, IPH standing for Innate Pharma, obviously. The IND filing is expected in 2023. Again, on enquête, uh, we have uh, generating a strong partnership with Sanofi, um, which has been disclosed um, this year, uh, in particular uh, with IPH6101 uh, that I, I, I briefly mentioned, which is uh, targeting AML BLAST. But we have also generated, uh, developed with Sanofi another molecule, uh, which is IPH6401. And uh, this molecule is uh, uh, recognizing the BCMA uh, tumor antigen. Under the terms of the license agreement, uh, Sanofi is responsible for the development, the manufacturing, and the commercialization of, of products resulting from this research collaboration. But Init Pharma is eligible to up to 400 million uh, euros in development and commercial milestone payments, as well as royalties on net sales. So that's for enquête. As for la QTAMA, uh, in 2022, uh, we have uh, preliminary data on phase two mycosis fugoides, which is one kind of cutaneous T cell lymphoma. Uh, and we have also preliminary data for phase two uh, Cesare syndrome. As for 2023, uh, we are looking for the final result of this phase two, both in mycosis fugoides and Cesare syndrome. And finally, uh, in 2023, we will be looking for preliminary data in PTCL. So a lot of things to look forward to. Dr. Eric Vervier, thank you so much for joining us today in the Youngers in Brief. Thanks, Pete. Thank you very much. Our next interview is with Dr. Daniel Tapper. Dr. Tapper is co-founder, chairman, and chief executive officer of Cytovia Therapeutics. Dr. Tapper, welcome to the Youngers in Brief. Very nice uh, talking to you today. Before we're going to talk about some of the exciting developments presented here at ASMO, you and your research team are focusing on NK cells or natural killer cells. Tell me a little bit more why you're focusing on this area of cancer research. Well, Peter, the, the, the better known uh, immune cells that are used to fight cancers are T cells. Natural killer cell cells are actually the innate immunity. They're the, the first line of defense that uh, newborn have, but the advantage of natural killer cells versus T cells, you know, are several. You know, first of all, they're naturally allogeneic, so they don't have to be specific to, uh, to the patient. Uh, the second thing is that they seem to be much, more to much better tolerated. Uh, so they do not cause cytokine release syndrome, which has been observed with T cells. They are not rejected, so no graft versus host disease, no neurotoxicity. And, and then thirdly, they can be used multiple times and potentially in multiple cycles. So it is an alternative to T cells that has you know, a very strong cytotoxic effect, but also has advantages in terms of uh, safety and availability. So if I understand this correctly, by using natural killer cells or NK cells, you are developing a safer drug with less adverse events. And it's also more easily available because and if you're looking at the revolution that came with the CAR T cells seven, eight years ago, 
They're very effective on select patients, but they can also be very toxic on, on some patients. And they're much more difficult to use outside of the hospital you know, context. NK cells can be more easily used on an outpatient basis. You refer to the fact that this approach can have a broader use than CAR T cell therapies. In contrast to your approach, CAR T cell therapies, although they are revolutionary kind of in what they can do, they focus on just one particular patient and require a so-called individual or custom approach to drug manufacturing, correct? Uh, the, the original T cell therapies are autologous. So it's basically you taking the blood of the patient, you are sending it to the lab, they're being modified and re-injected to the patient. You know, more recently, uh, several companies have developed donor-derived allogeneic T cells, uh, but it still remains to be seen whether they're as effective as the autologous uh, cells, but they're also promising. And that is one of the things that we've seen over the last couple of days here at ESMO. Now, in creating new therapies, you are actually using two different drug development platforms. Can you tell me a little bit more about these platforms and your development strategy? So we have two platforms. Cytovia has developed two platforms. The, the first platform are actually multi-specific antibodies, which target both the NK cells and the tumor cells. And what those flex NK engager antibodies do is that they redirect the NK cell to kill the tumor cell. So that's, that's one platform. And that's a platform that works well if the patient has enough functional uh, natural killer cells. It potentially works less well if uh, you know, patients doesn't have enough cells or those cells are not functional which is why you want to be able to augment the treatment with off-the-shelf NK cells. And that's our second platform. Our second platform are NK cells that actually are not coming from donors. They're coming from induced pluripotent stem cells. So they're available completely on demand. They're uh, differentiated from you know, stem cells. They're potentially gene edited before the differentiation, and you have a, a monoclonal master cell bank from which you can produce billions of cells. And they're available on demand for physicians uh, to use either on their own or in combination with the FlexNK cell engager antibody. Now, I just want to conclude on saying that Cytovia is the first company to have those platforms. There are several companies that have NK cells, including INKs or iPSC-derived NK cells. And there are also several companies that have NK cell engager antibodies, but we're the first one to have both. So we have the flexibility to test them separately or in combination. Let's take a short break, and then we're back with Dr. Eric Vervier, Dr. Daniel Tapper, and Dr. Neil Bender about some of the latest developments in cancer research presented during the annual Congress of the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ESMO, held earlier this year in Paris, France. You took the first step and quit smoking. But even former smokers may still be at risk for lung cancer. That's why SaveByTheScan.org wants you to know about a new low-dose CT scan that can detect lung cancer early. It takes only 60 seconds and could save your life. You took the first step, now take the next. Visit SaveByTheScan.org for a simple quiz to see if you're eligible and talk to your doctor about screening. SaveByTheScan.org is brought to you by the American Lung Association's Lung Force Initiative and the Ad Council. This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. In today's episode of the Yonkazine Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Eric Vervier, Dr. Daniel Tapper, and Dr. Neil Bender about some of the latest developments in cancer research presented during the annual Congress of the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ESMO, held earlier this year. I'm Peter Hoffland, and this is the Yonkazine Brief. With your technology, you can target different types of cancer. 
Tell me a little bit more about the kind of cancers that you're targeting or planning to target. So most approaches have been focused on hematological malignancies, uh, lymphomas and myeloma. And, you know, recently, you know, people have been getting more interested in whether we can tackle the solid tumors. And solid tumors are more complicated. The tumor microenvironment, you know, the whether the the antibodies uh, and or the cells are getting to the tumor. So it's a little bit more complex. So Cytovia has taken to actually do both. Our first two programs targeting respectively epithelial carcinoma, which is uh, the most frequent form of liver cancer, and multiple myeloma, which is uh, an hematological malignancy. You've mentioned the complexities of cancer, the complexities of hematological malignancies and solid tumors. In some cases, it seems that the development of novel treatment options for hematological disease may be easier than those for solid tumor. Can you tell me a little bit more about the complexities involved? You've mentioned, for example, the tumor microenvironment. What else is adding to the complexities? So the this the you know expression of uh, of receptor uh, on on the cells is not always consistent. So in selecting the NK engager antibody as part of our Flex NK, we went with NKP forty six, which is consistently expressed on NK cells, including on infiltrating NK cells in solid tumors. Other companies are using CD16 or NKG2D, which are sometimes shedded in their expression in uh, in uh, in solid tumors. So we leverage you know the 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 advantage of NKP46 to uh, venture into the solid tumors. We also had the opportunity of uh, uh, using GPC3 as a in a tumor antigen in a target. And GPT-3 is very well expressed on multiple solid tumors, including hepatocellular carcinoma in 70 to 80% of, uh, of, of patients. And it's not expressed, and like other tumor antigen, it's not expressed on healthy adult you know, cells. So the combination of having a relatively novel yet you know, validated target and having an NK engager that um, is expressed also on NK cells in the tumor, in, in the tumor environment, we thought was, uh, was promising. And that's where we undertook to, uh, took that strategy. And at this point in time, we have conducted multiple preclinical studies, and some of them have already been been presented at ACR and ACR liver and uh, now ESMO. Here at ESMO, we have a presentation on our flex in case cell engager that targets GPC3 and NKP46 alone and in combination with NK cells. So there are definitely a lot of very interesting developments here, which brings me to one of my concluding questions. In the near future, you may be able to bring a new drug for the treatment of hepatocellular carcinoma to market. Tell me a little bit more about that. So we are working toward filing two INDs in the first half of uh, 2023. We have completed preclinical studies. We've completed toxicology uh, for the GPC-3 program. We have a manufacturing process. Uh, we will have GMP material, you know, prior to filing the uh, the IND. So, so we're getting ready to be a clinical stage company in 2023, and that's very, very important. So, regarding um, the the hepatocellular carcinoma, what we will be uh, program, we will be initiating a phase one. Uh, so it's dose escalation and safety and pharmacokinetics with the GPC-3 targeted flex NK uh, cell engager antibody. We will also initiate um, uh, an investigator sponsor study that, um, and that will take place in, uh, in China, where we will pre-complex 
are iPSC derived NK cells with the GPC3 uh, NK engager antibody. So this is a novel approach that uh, AFIMED and MD Anderson have pioneered in the past year and have presented promising clinical results at, uh, at a couple of conferences. So we were doing it with our own product and this, uh, this will be initiated in 2023 as well. And in parallel, uh, you know, a myeloma program will also reach IND stage and, and clinical development uh, in, uh, toward the middle of uh, 2023. So based on your development program, are you planning to publish some of the new science and research in upcoming peer-reviewed journals? Yes, so we'll be publishing extensively. Uh, in, in 2022, we've presented uh, at multiple meetings. We also anticipate that we'll present at CITC and ASH you know, later in the year. We we're particularly excited about the data that we have with uh, gene edited and multi multi uh, gene edited iPSC derived NK cells, and, and I want to mention that because you know twenty twenty three for us is going to be the year of the NK cell engager getting into the clinic, but twenty twenty four is really the year for us where we have gene edited iPSC derived NK and CAR NK you know, cell product getting into the clinic. So, of course, the, we'll continue to have preclinical data in 23, but, you know, very quickly we should evolve toward the initial, you know, clinical data probably later 2023 and 2024. So a lot of, uh, a lot of progress uh, in the next two years in terms of uh, data supporting uh, of further clinical development. Dr. Tepper, thank you so much for joining us today in the Oncogen Brief. I'm sure that we can find more information about your research and development on your company's website and in various oncology-focused news journals, including, of course, Oncogen. Thank you again for being here with us today. In our last and final interview in this episode of the Oncogen Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Neil Bender about prostate cancer and new options to target this disease. Dr. Bender is Director of Urological Oncology Research at Well Cornell Medicine and co-founder of Convergence Therapeutics. Dr. Bender, welcome to the Oncogen Brief. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. So let me start with asking you, how common is prostate cancer and what are the current therapeutic options for patients diagnosed with this disease? But also, what are the specific unmet medical needs today? Prostate cancer is the, the single most common cancer in men. And about one out of eight men will develop prostate cancer in their lifetime. So obviously a, a very common problem. With respect to mortality from prostate cancer, there are in, in the United States approximately 30,000 deaths every year. If I recall correctly, in the world, there are something on the order of 300,000 deaths. So significant unmet medical need. There's a wide spectrum of the disease, uh, most patients present with early localized disease that is localized, confined to, to the prostate, but about 10% of patients in, in the Western world present at initiation or at diagnosis with disease that is already spread beyond the prostate. There have been enormous advances in the treatment of prostate cancer over the last approximately 10 years with the development of active chemotherapy agents, new types of hormonal agents that are particularly uh, effective or certainly more effective than the uh, earlier hormonal agents. But uh, as I've already mentioned, there are still a number of patients uh, who ultimately go on to die of their disease. So there is a significant unmet medical need, particularly after patients fail hormonal agents. Hor hormonal agents can manage the disease, generally speaking, for a, a number of years. But once patients fail hormonal therapy, it's, it's a much trickier ballgame. Let's take a short break, and then we're back with Dr. Eric Vervier, Dr. Daniel Tapper, and Dr. Neil Bender about some of the latest developments in cancer research presented during the annual Congress of the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ASMO, held earlier this year in Paris, France. Sarcoma. 
Odds are you've never heard that word before. For the 40 people diagnosed with sarcoma every day, it is a life-changing word because sarcoma is cancer. Through awareness, advocacy, and research, the Sarcoma Foundation of America is bringing hope to the families whose lives have been turned upside down by a cancer they had never heard of until diagnosis. Please join us in the fight to find the cure for sarcoma. For more information on the work of the Sarcoma Foundation of America, go to curesarcoma.org. This is the Yonkazine Brief with Peter Hoffland. And welcome back. This is the Yonkazine Brief. If you're just joining us, in today's episode of the Yonkazine Brief, I'm talking with Dr. Eric Vervier, Dr. Daniel Tapper, and Dr. Neil Bender about some of the latest developments in cancer research presented during the annual congress of the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ASMO, held earlier this year in Paris, France. So the important unmet medical need today is what to do next when hormone therapy fails, right? Now, I understand that you and your team are pioneering the development of a novel antibody specific to prostate cancer to solve this unmet medical need. Tell me a little bit more about this. I think one of the developments, broadly speaking, in in cancer over the last 30 years and and a development which has accelerated is our ability to understand how cancer differs from normal cells at a molecular level. And and the advantage of that is it allows us to much more precisely target the cancer cells along with the ability to spare normal cells. In the earlier days of, of cancer treatment, and by earlier days, I mean 20, 30 years ago, the only treatments for advanced cancer of any kind was chemotherapy. And while chemotherapy certainly has therapeutic benefits, it's not really targeted to the cancer cell. And and really what you're doing with conventional chemotherapy is you're hoping that these toxic drugs will kill the cancer cells before they kill the normal cells. But, But it's a fine line you're treading, which is why patients, many patients who undergo chemotherapy have side effects of very varying degrees. The inflection point, if you will, that's occurred over the last two to three decades has been the development of technologies that that allow us to dissect the differences between normal and cancer cells to identify those unique molecules that appear in cancer cells and not normal cells, and therefore let us develop much more precisely targeted agents. And specifically in the case of prostate cancer, I would say in, in prostate cancer, we have two fundamentally basic molecular targets that we can go after, one of which is is the androgen receptor, for which there have been hormonal treatments that were developed as far back as the, the 1940s. And as we alluded to earlier in the, in the conversation, the ability to target the androgen receptor has improved even in the last five years. We're getting much more efficient at targeting the androgen receptor. But we've known for all those decades that our ability to target the androgen receptor does not translate to cures. It translates to disease control for a period, generally speaking, of years, but but not cure. And so the second target of interest in prostate cancer is this molecule known as PSMA or prostate-specific membrane antigen. And that's a molecule that was first actually discovered about 35 years ago and we got involved in attempting to leverage that unique molecule, I, I would say about 20 to 25 years ago. But it's taken a long time for us to really evolve both the therapeutic and diagnostic options that target PSMA until relatively recently. And I would say a, a major inflection point was around 2016. The it's probably worth describing what this PSMA molecule is. And it's a molecule that appears on the cell membrane of prostate cells in general, but at much higher levels in prostate cancer cells. It appears on other normal tissues very rarely and just in a, in a few places, and generally places that, that have not proven to be particularly problematic in most cases. If we develop targeted diagnostic agents or targeted therapeutic agents, by and large, 
they target only prostate cancer cells. Again, there, there are some exceptions to that, but, but that's generally true. Where these agents have made substantial progress in the last several years is particularly in the development of our ability to image patients with prostate cancer. So there is now approved in the U.S. and outside the U.S. an imaging study, which is called the PSMA PET, positron emission tomography. This turns out to be substantially more sensitive than the conventional ways of imaging patients with prostate cancer. Those, those conventional ways included a bone scan, a CAT scan, or a magnetic resonance image. The PSMA PET, which again has is, is only been approved for about a year or so in the U.S., as I said, is substantially more sensitive. So we can see areas of prostate cancer, both in the prostate itself, but arguably more important, outside the prostate, far sooner than we can see them on, on any of the conventional imaging modalities I mentioned earlier. And, and that's of substantial benefit to the patients because it really helps direct therapy. It can tell us whether we need to focus the therapy, for instance, on the prostate itself or whether the disease is already spread beyond the prostate. And understanding that clearly drives how the physician is going to, to approach the patient. I understand that this is important when you look at something that is confined to the prostate or whether uh, the disease has metastasized, right? That's a critical distinction because if the disease is confined to the prostate, that patient can be treated with either surgery or radiation therapy to the prostate or a combination of the two. Conversely, if the disease has spread outside the prostate, you need to consider what we refer to as systemic treatments generally intravenous treatments, maybe in some cases oral treatments, but treatments that are designed to be able to reach every part of the body. On the therapeutic side of the equation, the ability to target PSMA is again already demonstrating the ability to improve the therapy for patients whose disease is spread outside the prostate. And again, we have the relatively recent example of an agent called Pluvicto, which is a molecularly targeted radiation isotope or radioactive isotope. So for patients who have disease that spread beyond the prostate, who have failed hormonal therapy, and who have failed chemotherapy, there is now this new modality, which was approved a few months ago, on the basis of the fact that it's been shown in a randomized phase three trial that it improves survival of those patients who are treated with that agent. And, and that is one of a variety of agents that are under development that are targeting PSMA. So there are other targeted radioactive agents being developed. We're involved in the development of an antibody that targets a very powerful radioactive isotope called an alpha emitter or actinium-225. And the data that I've presented at ESMO clearly shows that that is, a, is an effective agent, both in patients who have already been treated with Pluvicto as well as patients who have not been treated with a PSMA-targeted agent. And beyond that, you now have a slew of drug companies who are applying their own respective technologies with the goal of targeting PSMA to generate a variety of therapeutics to improve the survival of patients with prostate cancer. You have immuno-oncology agents, you have bispecific T-cell engagers, so-called that carry T cells to the tumor. You have antibody drug conjugates being developed. Those are antibodies that carry drugs targeted to PSMA. Again, you could think of antibody drug conjugates as the next generation of chemotherapies. It's, it's chemotherapy that's specifically targeted to the tumor cells to, to increase the efficacy of the drug, if you will, while also decreasing the toxicity. This ability to target PSMA is opening a whole new fundamental approach to treating prostate cancer that I strongly believe will uh, improve the, the survival of those patients. And again, we, I've already mentioned one example that, that's done that. One thing that comes to mind is that with conventional and current therapies, you'll be managing the disease without a cure. But in your approach, you're actually trying to develop a cure for the disease, correct? So I strongly believe that the ability to target PSMA will evolve into strategies that 
particularly when applied to patients earlier in the, in, in the evolution of the disease, will potentially cure some of those patients. What percentage of patients will be cured by, by PSMA-targeted approaches is, is anyone's guess. But I do have the conviction that the ability to target PSMA therapeutics is transformational and will evolve into our ability to cure some patients with disease. Again, remember I, what I told you was, again, if we take Pluvicto as the example, we can improve survival. But bear in mind, those studies and our studies and in general, early studies to demonstrate the efficacy of a drug take place in a patient population that has already failed multiple other forms of, of therapy and typically have large burdens of disease. Those are very difficult patients to cure. But again, the typical paradigm in drug development is once you show efficacy and safety in very late stage patients, you move the therapeutic earlier and earlier in the disease process. And it's been shown repeatedly in that approach that the therapeutic advantages increase significantly. And I, and I have every reason to believe that that'll be the case with PSMA-targeted agents. And, the, and as I said, we'll be able to cure some of those patients. And some of those trials are already, already underway. Well, that is very good news coming out of this year's ESMO. Dr. Neil Bender, thank you so much for joining us in the Youngest in Brief today, explaining some of the developments in the treatment of prostate cancer. My pleasure. In this episode of the Youngest in Brief, I spoke with Dr. Eric Vervier, Dr. Daniel Tapper, and Dr. Neil Bender about some of the latest developments in cancer research presented during the European Society for Medical Oncology, or ESMO, held earlier this year in Paris, France. For more information about this year's ESMO Congress, please visit our meeting coverage at oncuisine.com. For us here at the Oncuisine Brief, we want to thank you, our listeners, sponsors, and advertisers, for your ongoing support. Your support makes it possible that you can hear this program via PRX, Public Radio Exchange, and in the United Kingdom and mainland Europe via UK Health Radio. And you can also download our program via podcast and streaming media, including iTunes, Spotify, Audible, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and nearly anywhere you can find a good podcast. For more information about supporting the Oncuisine Brief, visit our website at oncuisine at oncuisine.com. And if you're living in the United States and want to receive our newsletter, text the word CANCER to 66866. That is 66866. And we will make sure that you'll receive our newsletter, which includes an overview of the latest news in oncology and hematology. Thank you all. And thank you for listening. And join us again for our next episode. I'm Peter Hovland, and this is The Youngest in Brief. The Oncazine Brief is a global medical educational service from the publishers of Oncazine and ADC Review, the journal of antibody drug conjugates. Support for the Oncazine Brief comes from our commercial underwriters and advertisers and the listeners to this station. For more information about advertising, underwriting, and sponsoring options, visit Oncazine at www.oncazine.com forward slash podcasts. The Oncazine Brief contains health and medicine related information and is provided for educational and entertainment purposes only. The content in this program is not intended as a substitute for professional medical or health advice and does not replace your doctor's advice and guidance. Your doctor is the best person to answer questions about your personal health. If you hear something in this program that doesn't agree with what your doctor has told you, ask him or her about it.